I'd like to cover three talking points. One is that the principle of unrestricted kinematic alignment is to resurface the prearthritic knee and restore the native trapezoidal flexion space. When you do kinematic alignment with manual instruments, it is more accurate than robotics. And the third one is that relative to mechanical alignment, unrestricted kinematic alignment has better outcomes, comparable 7, 10, and 13 year implant survival, and negligible risk of varus loosening. So let's look at the principle of kinematic alignment. It's a simple concept. The goal is to set the components coincident to the patient's prearthritic joint lines of the knee, which co-aligns the three rotational axes of the knee with those of the components. So let's look at a schematic of four views of the femur. The green transverse line is the axis about which the tibia flexes and extends. The magenta line is the axis about which the patella flexes and extends. And the longitudinal axis that's vertical to these two lines is the one about which the tibia internally and externally rotates. These three axes are either parallel or perpendicular to the patient's prearthritic joint lines. So it follows that if you want the femoral and tibial components to restore the kinematic axles, they have to resurface the knee. And when you do so, you get medial ball and socket kinematics like the native knee. Now, arthroscopists know that the flexion space of the native knee is trapezoidal and not rectangular, which is the goal of gap balancers and functional alignment surgeons. You know this when you look at the lateral compartment with the knee and a little bit of flexion, the gap is always bigger than the medial compartment. With kinematic alignment, we want to maintain that relationship. And it's important to do so, as shown in this schematic, where in extension, we like to have a tight rectangular extension space with equal medial and lateral gaps. But as shown in this plot, with flexion angle on the x-axis and varus valgus laxity on the y-axis, in extension, there's very little play. But when you flex the knee, then you get a trapezoidal space and the lateral side opens more than the medial side, and it progressively increases to 90 degrees. And so we want to maintain in kinematic alignment that normal laxity pattern of the knee and not tighten the lateral side down, trying to get a rectangular space. Now, kinematic alignment with manual instruments is actually more accurate than robotics for setting the femoral component. Here's an example of how caliper kinematic alignment restores the patient's prearthritic alignment in a severe varus knee. This is what the radiograph looks like, but all the ligaments are fine, of course, except for the ACL. And when you look at this knee as it's exposed, you can see that in full extension, there's usually very little bone wear because the knee doesn't fully extend. Same in flexion. So we can compensate for cartilage loss by referencing the bone and adding two millimeters back for cartilage wear. And so in this projection of a, a different knee, where there's a varus wear medially and cartilage is missing medially, we have a worn paddle on the medial side with a two millimeter buildup to correct for the loss. And this guide is drilled directly to bone, which plans and executes the distal cut at the same time. And then we go ahead and we measure the pieces we take off. And we want the thickness of the pieces to equal that of the femoral components condyle after we add a millimeter back for the curve of the blade and two millimeters back for cartilage wear when present. We do the same with posterior referencing guide, and it too is bolted to the femur so that we reference and plan and execute the cuts without using any images whatsoever. In a varus knee, we'd like both posterior cuts to be seven millimeters thick when there's no cartilage loss. When you add a millimeter back, it equals the thickness of the femoral condyle of the component, which is eight millimeters. The total time to, from exposure to achieving these four cuts in this case was eight minutes, so it's very efficient. Interoperatively, we record these verify, uh, caliper verified resection thicknesses on a worksheet so we can go back and check our work during the case if we get a little bit confused. These values are also added to the operative report because the cuts determine the outcome of the knee. And when they're correct, you get high forgotten joint score and Oxford score and Womack score. And when you don't, the scores are less. Caliper verified K quickly restored this patient's function. Here he is at six weeks. He underwent no formal physical therapy. There's his range of motion. And when we look at the post-operative radiograph, we want to always check the other side and compare to it because our goal is to restore the patient's prearthritic joint line and the opposite side can be often used as a comparison. So we want the distal lateral femoral angle, approximately the tibial angle to be the same. And then that gives some validation radiographically we achieved our results. Now, kinematic alignment with manual instruments is more accurate than robotics. 
This paper was published looking at a negligible effect of surgeon experience on the accuracy and time to perform unrestricted caliper verified KA with manual instruments published in 2022. If we look at the femoral resections, distal medial, distal lateral, posterior medial, posterior lateral, and we look at the 261 knees done by the 14 surgeons, you can see the deviation from target was zero with a standard deviation of about 0.2, 0.3 millimeters. When we compare the deviation from target for those same femoral resections with a robot, the deviation is much greater, averaging about 0.5 to 0.6 millimeters, and a standard deviation is two to three times higher. If we look at the ROSA robot, it's the same. The standard deviation, uh, the mean difference is about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 millimeters with a standard deviation also two times higher. So if you want an accurate surgical technique, you can get rid of the images, go right to the bone, and use manual instruments and have an efficient way to set the femoral component kinematically correct. Now relative to mechanical alignment, unrestricted kinematic alignment has been shown in multiple studies to have better outcomes comparable 7, 10, and 13-year implant survival, and negligible risk of varus loosening. 11 of 13 randomized trials, case control and case series, of bilateral TKA report KA in some measure is better than MA. And you can start with Dossett's study in 2014 in the U.S., move to Calier's study 2017 in Germany, and then to Japan in 17, Australia 19, Australia again in 2020, Japan 2020, Australia 2020, Germany 2020, USA 2021, Israel 2021, and now back to the USA in 2022 at special surgery, where Obulik showed superior outcomes with KA versus MA in their cohorts. I believe this is global validation of kinematic alignment. And I also believe it's the tip of the iceberg of what is to come. Now, if we look at the revision rate, this study looked at the, showed a similar revision rate of KA using PSI compared to all other total knee arthroplasties results from the Australian and New Zealand joint replacement registries. And this was the Otis Med knee. And at seven year follow-up, the KA TKAs had a similar revision rate as all other TKAs of the same brand implant, which were presumably placed with mechanical alignment. My own study looked at the 10-year implant survivorship of unrestricted KA and compared to other cohorts, which is not a level one study, but is better than MATKA. Our results at 10 years showed a 98.5% aseptic survival of 220 KAs performed in 2007. The results won't change much. We're almost done the 15-year evaluation at present. But you look at the 10-year follow-up for MA done by Bonner, the revision rate's a little bit higher, and the implant survival is also uh, not quite as high with Perrette's study when you backwork the data to 2010. Now, finally, Dawson, in this past week, just published the results of his randomized trial with long-term follow-up, once again with the Otis knee, and their conclusion was that kinematic alignment demonstrates excellent mean 13-year results comparable to MATKA with similar reoperations, complications, and patient reported outcome measures long term. RSA analysis shows that there's a negligible tibial component migration risk with up to 10 degrees of so-called barris tibial alignment. And in this particular study, which I'll share with you in a moment, we used tantalum markers, placed eight of them in the tibia, and used model-based RSA to determine migration of the base plate. This is the proximal medial tibial angle that we measured. And if we look at the results from the paper, you can see that the proximal tibial angle on the x-axis with more varus to the right and one year maximum total point motion or measurement of migration, you can see that most of our patients in this cohort were so-called varus outliers according to the mechanical alignment criteria. And yet there was lower migration as the varus increased. And that's because of the superior soft tissue balancing achieved with kinematic alignment that cannot be achieved with other techniques. So there's negligible tibia component migration with up to 10 degree virus tibia component based on RSA and based on seven, 10 and 13 year follow-up studies. And in this RSA study, low and non-progressive tibial base plate migration over one year in 35 patients with unrestricted KA with a medial conforming design alleviates any concern that unrestricted KA increases the risk of tibial component loosening. So to summarize, I think the take home message is based on these international evidence-based studies and the accuracy of manual instruments with caliper, caliper verification 
isn't it time to consider that unrestricted kinematic alignment is the gold standard total knee arthroplasty procedure? Robots are essential for non-physiologic knee replacement techniques like functional alignment, which chases rectangles with the undesirable consequence of laterally over-tightening the flexion space that in our view should remain trapezoidal like in the native knee.